Tonight, we're going to do a little bit of gastro diplomacy and talk about the politics of food as we cook. Um, so I hope, you know, you'll take a little bit of a history lesson in, 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 in that and, and, and the valuations of this dish. Um, shall we start? Is everyone ready? Should I give you more time? Okay, perfect. Everyone is ready. Okay, great. So to begin, we're going to go with the ingredients first and then we're talk about the dish. The dish is called the Bedouin chicken. Now, there's no such thing as the Bedouin chicken. So if you end up with some Bedouins in Morocco or in the Arab world, do not ask for Bedouin chicken. They'll have no idea what you're talking about. However, the, the mother of this dish or where this dish is derived from is a dish called maklube. And maklube is a Palestinian dish that means upside down because we tilt the pot when uh, we make it. It is made usually with meat or chicken has fried eggplant or fried cauliflower made with rice and cooked in stock. And it's almost like a rice cake with meat. Now, when in 2016 or 2017, I took over a small location on the Lower East Side on Rivington Street, which used to be the uh, previous location for Chef Eddie Wong from Bauhaus. So if you watch Fresh Off the Boat or if you watched uh, Wong's World, that used to be his place. And I wanted to do uh, a very a Palestinian dish, if you will, or an Arab dish, but it didn't take so much labor to do. So how can we derive it? And I came up with a chicken and rice dish. I called it the Bedouin chicken. The chicken and rice dish was really a play on the flavors of the makruba dish. But at the same time, it was because halal food was becoming popular in New York. And according to everybody in New York City, halal food is just chicken and rice from a cart on the street with very questionable sauce. Now. The truth of the matter is, is that's not really what halal food is. Halal is a way of butchering, similar to kosher, things like that. Um, but this was a different way of looking at it. So we're going to begin with the ingredients. Now we have the, the key here, which is the seasoning. Now, if you didn't get the instructions of what the seasoning is, is six parts allspice, three parts black pepper, three parts salt, one part cinnamon, and one part ground cardamom. That's all it is. So you make one big batch and then you can use it as much as you want. We give you guys two ounces in your kits. We have chicken stock. Now, of course, Chef Alex, who uh, cooks for you guys here, the meals at the Migrant Kitchen is an, an amazing El Salvadorian chef, likes to make everything from scratch, but you can definitely buy bottled um, chicken stock or better than bouillon and add the water. That works just fine. Uh, two pounds of chicken is going to be a breast and a thigh. So basically half a chicken rice, cooking oil or olive oil, if you like, if you have it, parsley. And we usually add some pomegranates, which we didn't have because we couldn't find the pomegranates or some almonds, if you like, we can toast them and add them on top. Half an onion. Now, uh, if you have a full onion at home, the only key is never to cut the root because if you cut the root, that's when you start crying. So, and the idea is to slice it and then cut it short. So we're gonna begin together and we're gonna do this together. Before and we of course, begin, uh, sir, we have a question from the audience. Sure. Uh, the ones who are joining us from afar, sure. they want to know what exactly is in the spice ingredients so they can cook it up themselves. Yeah, so six parts old spice. Six parts old spice. Three parts black pepper. Three parts salt. One part cin ground cinnamon. And one part ground cardamom. The idea is that you make a very small batch based on those ratios, and then you can use just two ounces per pound. One you part have to say it again, I can't write that fast. You gotta like either write. Yeah, it it in the chat yeah so all all your questions, guys, just type it in the chat, and we'll I'll relay everything Nasser is saying in the chat. So if you go to the chat, we got the whole spice list there for you. Uh, six parts old spice, three parts black pepper three parts salt. And what was after that chef? One part ground cinnamon, one part cinnamon, one part ground cardamom. Brown cardamom. cardamom. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. And when you say parts, do you mean teaspoons, tablespoons? Yeah. So whatever, like if you use a teaspoon or a tablespoon or a, or a quart, it doesn't matter as long as you do it in those ratios. Uh, the way that I like to give, uh, you know, proportions for spices, uh, is based on equivalent ratios versus, uh, you know, uh, tablespoons and half spoons. So just as long as you're using the same tool of measurement for all the parts. Cool. All right. Uh, now let's begin. 
So we're gonna, you know, heat our pan a little bit here uh, on the pan on the stove. We're not gonna put anything in it yet. We're gonna definitely start by cutting the onions, right? And we mentioned that if you cut through the onion, you will bleed. And uh, the knife. Yes, chef Alex. You know, I am a chef without a knife. Look at that. That is so upsetting and sad. <laughs> but I'm going to blame Charlie for this. <laughs> um, so until we get the knife. So we're going to definitely dice up the, um, the onion. Thank you, Charlie. All right. So the way we dice up onions is very simple. We just go, we make these very thin lines across. The, the onion itself, as you can see, right? Then we make insertions right here. One, as you can see, and then on top, two, right? So it's almost like you're cutting through the pie, as you can see, right? And then on the bottom, three, right? So three layers of cuts across and over, yeah? And then we just cut. And that way, you will get all the onions in this form, yeah? Like very nice pieces. Okay, so we begin. All right. And we can chop them up a little bit more. What's amazing about this dish is that it only takes like 20 minutes to make. It's very flavorful. You can have it for a quick dinner. And you can also use it as a way to impress your friends and people will think that you trained for one year in Paris when you just hang out with me for like 20 minutes, you know? So that's really an awesome thing to do. So then we are, the, the pan is nice and hot. The oil is not in it. We just heat up the pan first. And then we add the cooking oil. Right? And then we quickly add the onions for a little bit. We don't want the onions to burn, so this has to be really, really fast. Or you can tone down the heat a little bit, which is what I'm gonna do until I season the chicken, right? Now, when you guys are handling chicken, it's really important that you consistently wash your hands or have gloves. Clearly, like, salmonella is, is a dangerous thing, so please make sure that everything is washed, everything is nice and clean. Um, if you do, uh, handle raw chicken on your cutting board, make sure that everything is wiped down, Clorox, all that stuff. That way, you know, you're safe and healthy. Now, chicken, uh, it's okay to have the skin, okay without the skin, either way, the skin adds a little bit of flavor. Uh, boneless chicken breast, boneless thigh, and now we begin to season. Now the seasoning here, we're gonna use half of the seasoning, just to get across, you see. And we're gonna use the, the other half, really, uh, when we're making the rice. Because everything about this dish is made in one pot. Okay, now we have now used, see? So it's very seasoned well, it's all over, right? And you can see it's done. Now, we're gonna put the, the pan on high heat and we're gonna wait a little bit until things start sauteing. Start seeing the onions. Until they begin to turn golden. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna sear the chicken on both sides for like two minutes. Make sure it's fully seared. And then afterwards, we're going to put half the broth or half the stock in the chicken and let it boil until it reaches 163 Fahrenheit. So that would be around 10 to 15 minutes until it's fully cooked and it's not dry, right? Chef, uh, we have Anita, I House Class of 2011, asks, Hi, Anita. what kind of oil would you recommend to saute? I always use cooking oil because olive oil, although it's more flavorful, tends to have a high burn temperature. So if you're not quick with it, you will burn it. So yes, just use regular cooking oil, like what, the one that we sent in the kit, and I think that should be fine. Excellent. And uh, Mad Boo is at, she's cooking a, a pound of chicken. How much spice mix would you recommend for a full pound? One ounce, right? And of course, like if you have extra salt, if you want more extra salt, then that's, you know, depend for you later. 
uh, but I use like from the two ounces we gave you, I use half. I will use the other half on the rice once we make it, okay? Now, as you can see, the onions are now beginning to bleed as in like the water's coming out of it, they're cooked. And now I can start putting in the chicken breast. So we put the first one and then we put the thigh at the same time, right? And very simply, right? I'm gonna also take the pan off so you guys can see. I don't know if you wanna lift the laptop a little bit just so you can see that, right? So as you guys can see in the pot here, you know, the onions are cooking and then we are just searing the chicken on both sides, like kind of like that. You see now the one part is kind of seared. The other part is almost getting seared. We wanna sear them completely on both sides. So roughly a minute and a half on each side. Right? Now, if you keep moving the onions, they will not get stuck to the pan, they will not burn. So keep doing that until the chicken is fully seared and you can see a glaze of whiteness that's, that killed the raw texture on both sides. Guys, make sure that the heat is medium so you don't burn it overcooked, right? All right. Now, this is the best and most fun part of the process because after this, you have a break for like 15 minutes, which is really half the cooking process. So, you know, we can just hang out and talk about gastro diplomacy while that happens. So now, as you guys can see, It's sauteed, you see that it's also like uh, seared on both ends, right? And you can see that the oil is now also being this water coming out and I'm just gonna put enough stock in it to completely kind of drown it. So that's around two cups, you see that? It's inside. And now we're gonna let it get to boil and from the point of boiling is around 10 to 12 minutes. So a total together around 15 or so. So now we put it and now we have to wait for this to boil and once it boils and we get it and we test the chicken and make sure it's fully cooked we're going to remove the chicken we're going to add the rice and cook it in the stock of the chicken and add a little bit more stock and let the rice you know you can season it with more seasoning if you want you can add salt if you like and then from there let the rice steam and once it gets to full steam we will begin to serve the dish but in the meantime, as this boils, let's talk a little bit about why food is very important in the context of conflict. So one thing that is happening now these days, and I think the, you should definitely watch this film that's coming out called The Hunger War, and it's about the famine in Yemen. And Yemen tended to be a very rich culture when it comes to cuisine, and also one of the main importers and uh, exporters, I'm sorry, of coffee. And unfortunately right now, the dire situation in Yemen has gotten to a point where we are facing one of the worst humanitarian famine crisis in the 21st or even the 20th century. And with that said, we can't love a people and eat their food and not necessarily be able to help them. So how do we talk about the context of Yemen through coffee? So two years ago, to highlight the crisis in Yemen, which was completely sidelined because of the previous administration's support for Saudi Arabia. Um, we got a lot of support for Yemen after the Khashoggi murder. So we started doing dinners to highlight Yemeni food. And one of the things that we did is that we got a, a coffee rub and we, uh, it's a, a coffee spice rub, and we used it with lamb and steak. And we cooked for a lot of people to highlight it. And those are the kind of similar dinners that I know that pre-COVID IHAS was holding. And it's important to understand, like, if you're consuming every day something like coffee, 
where does this come from? Who is the farmer behind it? Why are they important? How, why do we need to help them? Because in the large scheme of things, usually the people who get marginalized the most are the farmers and the people who give you the source of the product. So it's really important to understand where your food comes from and why is it important and how does it affect the people that uh, are bringing it to you. Throughout COVID, we realized that the people who made the country work are the farmers, the cooks, and the delivery guys, right? And yes, the frontline workers, of course, and you know other uh, substantial or fundamental members of society. But the real matter is, is that it brought a lot of highlight to the people who we counted out. And now, if we look at the avocado farms, for example, and how people ship avocado, which also tends to be um, an item that gets used by drug cartels when the cocaine routes are down, right? Because of the need of avocado toast in America. So with that said, why is it important to pay the fair price and make sure to help out the farmer who's giving you the food? And this is something that I want you just to think about as you consume your meal, whether today or tomorrow or anytime you buy it, simply because food is not uh, something that we can count as apolitical. Food is a very political thing. And to say it's not political is a very privileged statement. And that's something we have to talk about. We've got a couple of questions for you from the audience, Chef. Yep. First off, Ron uh, would like to know the name of the film one more time so I can put it in the chat. The Hunger Ward. It's unfortunate. It's a very happy movie. And it's about children who are dying of famine in a hospital in Yemen. All right. And we have... Uh, where and when did you learn to cook? You know, my team will tell you that I'm a fake chef. And the reason behind that is that I didn't have to pay the dues for 20 years getting yelled at by major chefs to become a chef. Uh, but I actually learned how to cook from Dan Dorado, who gave you the last class, if you guys remember. But, you know, I beat him because I'm just more talented and I ended up becoming more, you know, aware of things and things like that. So. You know, he'll be a little bit bitter about it, but the truth of the matter is, is uh, it was just done really self-taught and with Dan as mentoring and uh, owning your own restaurant. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to wear multiple hats. Um, I remember in the beginning, I had a sous chef that quit and it was the middle of Friday night and I had to put my apron on and get going. And eventually I realized that, you know, the cooking, okay, is healing, cooking is nice, it's good, you bring joy to people, but the amount of empowerment that we can do with food is much more important to me than the meal that we're cooking. So this translated into a refugee dinner series that fed over 10,000 people and lifted thousands of refugees out of poverty. It was called Displaced Kitchens, which you can look up. It translated into a commercial kitchen in Istanbul that brought refugees and local Turks to work together to end racism and help women start their own food businesses, which was sponsored by the State Department and Shobani. And it also led to the creation of American halal beef and chicken, which now Morocco imports because it is an affordable source of food because as been I don't know if you know, but the Arab world consumes more meat than it produces. So this was a, the interaction that we like to give with food. And this is what we really care about the, in the micro kitchen. Of course, aside from giving you guys amazing food and you know giving amazing quality of, of innovative dishes and things of the sort but it's uh, really the impact element that matters. And can you do this impact on scale? I mean, really that's what that matters, right? It's not just about talking about it. It's not just about highlighting it. It's like, can it actually solve the problem? So to put it simply, can we bring Bourdain and Jose Andreas together in one execution? Amen to that. Yeah. And uh, we got some questions one coming second. in now. And as you can see guys, it's now boiling, right? And we're gonna continue to boil it a little bit, right? until it gets better, but you can smell it already, right? The flavor and things coming together. And, and we got some uh, people from the audience wondering when they add the rice. The rice will be added after we take out the chicken. So in a couple of minutes, we will take out the chicken and we will make sure it's fully cooked. And then the water is already boiling. We're gonna add the rice to it, a little bit of more stock. And then we're gonna put it on medium heat and let it cook until it's tender and, 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 spicy and tasty. So remember, chicken first, chicken comes out, rice goes in. Of course, you could do this you know, in, in a separate pan and cook the rice separately and all that stuff. But you know, I hate doing dishes. So I figured, you know, 
one pot makes it work. Because in, in the beginning, when I was in the restaurant, like I told you, I lost my dishwasher. So I was a cook in the dishwasher. And let me tell you, washing dishes in a restaurant is an awful, awful job. So kudos to all the dishwashers of America today, which God bless them. I mean, it's a very hard job. And, and we got some folks here in the audience who actually weren't within the house when Chef Dan cooked up that brilliant cauliflower shawarma. So Chef, if you could just elaborate a little bit on the Migrant Kitchen, our mission of feeding the food insecure and how it all came to be. Just a quick little anecdote for our uh, first timers in the house tonight. Sure, but let me double check the chicken first, right? All let's right, let's goes. take a look at that chicken. So I took the chicken off the pan, as you guys can see, right? And I wanna see if it's cooked. And the way you check chicken is cooked is that you just, you know, you can either pierce through it and see if look based on touch. Like I know it's cooked, for example, right now, but like, if you don't know the easiest way to do it, and this is not gonna kill the flavor, is that you take the chicken out, right? Like that, like that, right? And then you do just do a little bit of an insertion here and see if it's raw or cooked. And as you can see, it's fully cooked, right? So let's check that again for a second. You wanna wanna check your chicken is cooked. Make sure if you have a thermometer, if it's at 163 degrees, you're good to go. So I'm a good. At, I'm just gonna give it another minute just in case, so you guys can follow us in the house. And while that is going for one minute, I'll tell you about the migrant kitchen. Food insecurity is not just that people are hungry and there is no food at home, right? And that is a reality. That is actually a reality. Here in America today, in Jackson Heights, we work with a lot of food pantries that the need is around 2,000 meals a day, especially from a lot of families who are day laborers who unfortunately lost all their jobs and they don't have the benefits of unemployment insurance and things like that because they're undocumented workers, right? But let's take it a step further. When we were in Beirut in August, before and after the explosion, we saw, found a lot of Syrian refugees that ran away from the atrocities of Bashar al-Assad. And there's no food in the house. And Lebanon is already going through an economic crisis in which the minimum wage monthly became $45. There's a shortage of electricity. No money can be withdrawn out of the banks. There's a run on the banks. It's similar to Argentina 1990 times four. And there's a lot of hunger. So because there's a lot of hunger, kids are taken out of schools and they're out to beg on the streets. And since the money ran out to beg for, there's unfortunately a lot of prostitution. We had to bury a child for 200 bucks because his family couldn't afford to do that. I mean, we really have to think about these things when we talk about like the fact of not having enough food to feed your family, to feed your children, and what does that lead to? It's a very dangerous thing. It's a very sad thing. And at the Migrant Kitchen, we aim to stop all of that. So I'm very happy to announce that we have been taking care of thousands of families in Beirut. We have moved people out of the camps at certain points. And we continue to do that around the globe. And yeah, we did it on a, you know, what we think is a small scale. A lot of people think it's a big scale, but because the need is, we're in an ocean of need. I hope we can do this for Iraq. I hope we can do this for Yemen. I hope we can do this for Jackson Heights. And that's really the, uh, the ethos of the migrant kitchen. All right, so now the chicken has been here for a minute. We're gonna take it out and we're gonna let it rest, right? And then, we're going to take, so you guys have a lot of rice in those core containers. We're not going to use all of it. We're going to use half of it. Of course, if you have, you're cooking for more people like Frank, you're cooking for three people, you might want to use all of it, right? But now we leave the stock here a little bit. We add the rice as much as you want from the rice. And, and chef, real quick, uh, Marik is just joining us. He's a little behind. When does he add the stock? The stock is added right after you sear the chicken. Right after you sear So it. you guys, you can see I used like three quarters of the pint we gave you. And I'm gonna take the rest of the stock, right? And I'm gonna make sure that it's not too much water. Remember, like it's always like, depending on the rice grain that you have. So if you have basmati rice, it's uh, two cups of rice to two a quarter cup of water. If you have, uh, you know, American rice and it's like, you know, two cups to two cups, the ratio is one to one. So you really have to know. So the rice that we gave you guys today is just traditional American rice. So we're not gonna add too much stock. As you can see, it's gonna be there. 
what you have already in the pan might work, but I'm just gonna add just a tiny bit more. And now I'm just gonna let it sit on low heat and let it uh, cook. Of course, you can add a lot of things to this rice if you want. You can add more salt, uh, but I like to do that at the end. You can add, if you like, um, some uh, cranberries or you can add pomegranates. I mean, that's a very Persian way of making rice. Um, or you can add butter, I don't know. So, but you know, we'll leave that until uh, until the end. Also a very Mor Moroccan way of doing it. If you ever have tagines, they make uh, a lot of tagines with fruit, which gives it a, you know, a balance of umami, if you will. So now, uh, as we make the rice, don't forget that we have this piece of bread. And what are we gonna do with this? So, in the Arab world, there's a bread called markouk, and markouk usually is thin mountain bread that is made almost like naan style, if you ever had naan, the Indian bread. So now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna get these tortillas, which are, you know, or wraps, which are very similar. And then once the rice comes to an end, we're gonna just, for 30 seconds, heat up the bread on both sides. And then we're gonna plate the rice on top. We're gonna shred the chicken, add it on top, and then season it with, uh, or garnish it with parsley. And then uh, Madhu is asking, when when shall we add the rest of the spice to the rice? Or is that towards the end? The spice to the rice is towards the end. I, you know, it's based on your flavor profile. So once the, the rice gets, you know, a little bit ready and you can taste it, taste it. See if you like it. See, it needs more salt. See, it needs more seasoning, depending on your flavor profile. But like the way that we do it in the restaurant is that we add just a dash bit more to the rice. But don't forget the stock has already all the flavor from the seasoning. So you don't want to overpower it and make it overly flavorful. Uh -huh. You see, now it's boiling again and it's going to take some time until it um, steams. Of course, if you have a rice cooker, then that makes it all easier, right? So you can just take the stock, put the rice in it and you're good to go and then you don't have to do the to uh, the dual process here. And uh, Hani wants to know when adding liquid to rice is liquid above rice level in pot by how much? Where should they? So the it? ratio is always uh, one to one or one quarter to one depending on the rice. For this particular rice, it's going to be one to one. So as long as you're doing it and it's not overflowing, it's right sitting on top of it, right sitting on top of it. You guys are an awesome bunch, I really have to say. I can't wait for to cook for you guys post-COVID here, and hopefully we can have an amazing, amazing dinner. So uh, let's check in with the audience. How's everyone's uh, chicken coming along? Is the chicken cooked? You guys can uh, taste it, smell it. We got, uh, we got Robin over there with some movements. All right, got a nice wave of affirmation that leads us to believe it's coming along well. Good. Now it's just making the rice, just like you make any other rice, right? And now it's going to take a little bit of some time, but we will get there. Now you're wondering, like, oh, is this chicken going to get really cold? If you're doing it correctly on time, it would not be get cold. But if it does get cold, all you have to do is just put it for 30 seconds on top of the rice and it will steam up back again without overly cooking. All right, and I think, uh, oh, Robin's doing well, copy that. And Hani, I think it, it might be running a little behind here. How many minutes overall to cook the chicken, chef? The chicken should not take you from sauteing to until you take it out of the pan more than 15 minutes, 15 to 16 minutes. And uh, all right, we got a, you ready for a, a heavy hidden question here, Chef Nasser? Go ahead. Uh, Anissa wants to know, how do you make, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, hakaka? The kaka, the burnt bottom of the rice that her father used to make. I see. So we're talking about like, uh, what should we call tadeg also, uh, which is very affluent in Persian restaurants. Uh, you definitely need a lot of butter. So you don't necessarily get it stuck to the pan, right? It's a lot, a lot of butter. So if you put a lot of butter or ghee, 
which is not very healthy for you, but it's definitely delicious, uh, into the rice, then it will get stuck on the bottom and you can remove it and scrap it easily and serve it as a delicacy. One of my favorite restaurants in New York that serves that, if you are here, is go to Soufre with Chef Nassim al -Kaili. Now, Chef Nassim is the only Persian chef, I think, in the world that serves Persian food that is not a kebab. So she's received two stars from the New York Times and she makes amazing tadig and her restaurant is in Brooklyn. Please try to go and check it out. But yeah, just in terms of making that rice, if you want a delicacy, just add ghee or a lot of butter. Eventually it will stick once it dries and then you can eat it as a delicacy and then you can season it on top with sumac and other flavorable uh, spices as well. Right on, it looks like uh... Frank and, and his sous chef there are enjoying that. Yes, the mm -hmm. rice is almost coming, it's boiling. Though I can see the rice, as you can see. I want to show them. As you can Ooh, see right now, that. the rice is coming along. So mm. we'll wait a couple of minutes. All right. And uh, any substitutes uh, for the pomegranate seed, chef? Anything you can Yeah, I mean, uh, you could do, uh, if you have some almonds, some silver almonds, if you have some pine nuts, just, you know, some butter in a pan, uh, toast them until they're golden, add them on top. If you have a nuts allergy, then uh, parsley will make it happen. And pomegranate is just really for garnish to make the plate look pretty. Um, but it's not going to really take away from the flavor. Um, in terms of like, uh, condiments that are really good to add with is a garlic whip. And I can send you guys a recipe with Charlie about how to make a garlic whip at home without using mayo. Uh, so it's a garlic aioli, but without the mayo part. And garlic and chicken go excellent together. But it is a process. It requires a hand blender, some egg whites, and garlic and uh, some olive oil and vegetable oil as well, and vinegar. All right. How is the rice coming along, everybody? Is it almost ready? Can you, use, even if it's very liquidy, it's okay. Just like take it out and see if it's if it's ready for you. It's not necessarily supposed to absorb all of it because don't forget that it was cooked with a lot of chicken, there's a lot of juice, there's a lot of things flowing. So it's always going to be a little bit wet. All right. Robin wants to know, do you ever veer cheat with garlic powder? No. Uh, you could definitely try garlic powder, but I've not tried that. Right. Class of 77 represent there. Nice. All right. Check in with the audience. Anita, how you doing over there? Rice is almost ready on my end. As you can see, the water has been completely a little bit absorbed. As you can see, the rice now has made the holes for it to steam up. Right, and we're just gonna keep it a little bit and not so we don't burn it. We just keep checking on it and make sure that the rice is ready. The onions will be on top of the rice as they have simmered down and the liquid has evaporated. Is everyone's rice is ready? How is how is the rice on your end? If you guys can leave comments about where is your rice status. All right. Every, it looks like everyone is, is too focused comment, but signs all point to moving in the right direction. Cool. Some people are a bit behind, but Anita's saying, uh, both broth and chicken look fine. We're on the right trajectory here. We have, uh, oh, we got shouts out to Roman, who's 79, and Robin, who's 78, and their son, uh, Vic Tote, all in the house. Shouts out to you guys, family fun. Yes. Their, their rice is not done yet. John needs another three to four minutes on the rice, but cool. it's moving along. Cool, cool, cool. K is 70% done. Nice. Nora's a little bit behind, but so she's moving along. For me, the temperature of this chicken is fine, but if you want it extra hot, then the last minute before the rice ends, you can just add it on top of the rice, and that way it just can get some heat and stay warm, right? So you're not, right? And my rice is now fully ready, so I'm just gonna give it another minute. 
And while that is heating up a little bit of the chicken, if it's a little bit guy, I'm gonna heat up this bread. So we, if you wanna, like you could do this in the oven, of course, if you wanna feel safe about it. But like, I like to do it very quickly on the, on the, on the, on the stove top. So as you can, you wanna lift up the, the right? Now, don't burn yourself. I use my hands, but if you have tongs, please use those. Always stay safe in the kitchen. It only takes 30 seconds of something to ruin a perfectly good evening, right? Okay, so we have the, the bread here. It's not gonna take that long. It's like 30 seconds. We just flip it back and forth until you see the marks. If you want it to be like extra flavorful, you can add butter. Like you can rub butter on this bread, but it's not healthy, but it's really delicious. Anyway, by the way, guys, the secrets to all New York restaurants or restaurants around the world is butter, right? Nothing is that exceptional. They just add a lot of butter and that's why it tastes amazing. So that's just, just remember that. All right, and now, as you can see, this is the uh, one part here, it got toasted, right? And now we're gonna do the second part. And now my chicken and rice is ready. All the liquid is gone, as you can see, right? I'm gonna put it on the side. Now I'm gonna take out this bread, which is ready. And now we're gonna plate rice, sorry, bread on the plate like that. And then we're gonna take out the chicken. Yeah, of course, if you're using a clean board, make sure this is wiped down because there was raw chicken on this as well. Let's make sure that this is clean, right? Or go on a clean area on the board. And now start slicing the chicken, All right? You see that? Again, make sure the chicken is fully cooked. Uh, John wants to know, chef, what would you recommend to drink with this dish? You know, uh, if you're wine drinkers, I love Riojas. They're really good. Um, any kind of red wine is my favorite, but if you want to do it the Arab way, you drink it with Pepsi, which is our equivalent of Pepsi. Um, and you know, it, it is, you know, it's, it's a meal that will put you to sleep, but it's really, really good. All right. Now we take out this chicken as well. We take out the rice. Okay. Guys, make sure your chicken is 163 degrees and you can see, see the rice is very Fluffy is already in the stock, very good. And it's not stuck to the pan, which is really important, right? All right. Now this could serve as a, you know, as a meal for two. As a rule of thumb, by the way, if you're ever cooking dinner for guests, a person cannot consume more than a half a pound of food, which only includes four to six ounces of meat. So just think about that and that will save you a lot of money when you're cooking fancy dinners uh, for your guests, right? All right. Okay. Is everyone chicken cooked? Got a couple folks who need to heat it up a little bit longer. Yeah, you can. Heat it up a little bit longer, or you can just take it into the pan, right? After you slice it, if you like, and then you can take it and put it back in and then just put a little bit of oil and just saute it on both ends and it'll be ready in 30 seconds, right? So let's do this together in case this is not the case. But the idea is that you wanna leave the piece intact because all the juices are flowing through it. You want it to be juicy because after you shred it and then you cook it again, it dries it out a little bit. There's also another secret which we can send you called brining in which we leave the chicken overnight in salt and sugar, which is uh, Marcus Samuelson's secret. He has the sugar part, brown sugar in particular. And it will make the, the chicken so flavorful, but the next day you can't add too much salt because there's already salt inside. Okay. Everybody's chicken. Who has the, the intact pieces of chicken on 163? Everybody okay? Looking good. All right. All right. So whoever didn't get it done to that. All right. Okay. 
All right. Now, as you can see, the rice and the chicken, right, on top of each other over the bread. And now the parsley, right? On top, if you have the pomegranate seeds, it makes it even nicer. And voila. Now this dish traditionally is consumed with cucumber yogurt. So you just basically take a couple of spoons of uh, regular yogurt, Shobani, traditional yogurt, Greek yogurt is great. Then you add a little bit of salt to it, maybe like a quarter teaspoon. And then you add Persian cucumbers or in England, they call them Lebanese cucumbers. They're the small ones, you cut them up and you add it on top. You could also add garlic if you like, but without garlic it's great because then it can sit in the fridge for some time and not necessarily go sour in two days. And dinner is served. So whoever has it ready to taste it and let me know what you guys think. Bon appetit. All right, anyone done yet? We're still cooking. We have, uh, Vinit says it's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinit, for joining us tonight. Again, for the salt purposes, if you want more salt, just add on top. It really depends on your flavor profile. I love a lot of salt, Charlie doesn't. So yeah. it really takes it from there. But by the way, guys, this seasoning that we gave you works on everything. Use it on steak, use it on chicken, use it on fish, use it on salmon. It's great, you know, so uh, you can use it across the board. All right, we got a couple questions from the audience, Chef. So uh, first off, Madhu says, this is awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anissa says, thank you, Chef. She's a big fan of the lots of butter tip. Yeah. Uh, Anita wants to know, what veggies do you recommend as a side dish? So uh, this is a very heavy dish. So I don't necessarily, you know, say cauliflower or broccoli, but let's, uh, let's go something light. Uh, so for example, I think that, uh, cucumbers are delicious on the side of it. Eggplant works well, especially if it's like sliced thin and fried and added on top or sauteed or baked. Um, I really love zucchini. So if you get zucchinis and you put them into little stripes, almost like French fries, some salt, some pepper, saute them in the pan until like they're fully cooked. Those are great additions on the side as well. All right. Gabby says, thank you, and has shown much love from Germany. We got Germany in the house, so it's around midnight out there. So thank you so much, Gabby, for joining us. I really have to uh, thank you, Gabby, and thank the German people. I really have to tell you what you guys have done for humanity teaches the world a whole new lesson and what you guys have done with Syria and Syrian refugees. So thank you for that, and uh, much love from the United States and beyond to all of you. And we got Robin who wants to know what's the best way to reheat uh, today, Friday is Lent. So she's not eating meat, but she's still joined us tonight. So shouts out to you, Robin. How would you reheat this dish, Chef, if we're gonna eat it for say Saturday lunch? Absolutely. So uh, if you have not added the chicken to the rice, uh, then you can just like heat them separately in the, in the microwave. But honestly, uh, there's a play. I'm gonna tell you a little story. There's a play uh, called The Sunshine Limited, which starred, um, uh, man, I completely forgot the names of the actors. It doesn't matter, but one of the dishes, right? It says, it's like, why do rich people versus poor people make, you know, what's the difference between them and food? And the idea is, is that uh, people who have not uh, have to cook a meal that lasts three days. That's why we do a lot of these stews and rice in the Arab world, because where they have not. So uh, with this particular dish, you can just heat it up in the microwave, all of it together at once in just one plate and it will be exactly the same. It'll be fine. If you want not the rice to not to dry out a little bit, you can add a little bit of water, like some drop, drops of water and that will make it steam and not necessarily burn or become hard. All right, we got Rong showing love from California, Cali in the house. We got James who didn't get the, the bread right this time, but otherwise everything was excellent. The chicken uh, tastes good. You guys tried it? Chicken is good. We got, uh, Kritika, who has some leftover seasoning, what would you recommend? What does this seasoning go well with uh, if anyone wants to? One of the best things on. to use this seasoning is on salmon. So you'll get a salmon with the skin on it. You'll score it 
you'll put the seasoning inside and on, on the other side and then you'll cook it with salmon and I trust trust me it's it's going to be exceptional especially with butter All right, right on James is eating the chicken now uh, Robin says thank you so much Marie says thank you Ham says thank you lots of love coming to you from all around the iHouse universe chef thank you guys any, any I final hope you words enjoy it. uh thank you for joining us on this journey to feed humanity we love you all i just want to thank everyone for joining us thank you chef nasser and for our beautiful chefs we have in the house if they can just send us pictures of their wonderful masterpieces so that we can display them on our social media platform we would really love that <laughs> And you enjoy, everyone. We see you guys are focused, but we just want to make sure that you guys enjoy your meal. <laughs> enjoy. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Bye-bye. Bon appetit. Enjoy.